Hey, in this segment, we're going to deal with the inerrancy of the Bible, part two. I realized, I guess last night, that I really felt like I was rushing, and that in so doing, I had skipped some important topics. And so I'm going to slow down and enjoy this process more and just um, deal with some issues that... Um, that I'd like to come back to, like, uh, well, for example, I need to touch on some more things regarding inerrancy, canonicity, uh, miracles, uh, more about Satan, angels, and demons. Um, there are some other issues, but um, maybe a men and women and biblical perspective. Um, anyway. When I became a Christian in 1973, it was not long before I had to go off to college, and I was thrown into the lion's den. <laughs> the lion's den of biblical criticism of the worst sort. I knew instinctively that the Bible was riddled with errors and contradictions, like my professors kept saying over and over and over again then it could not be the Word of God. So I learned firsthand that in dealing with this issue in a straightforward manner is really important because it can cause pretty serious doubts. Um, so I'm hoping that this will be of real practical help to some of you in strengthening you in your faith. A little bit of logic can go a long way in reconciling most of these alleged contradictions and errors. The vast majority of religion professors in America and abroad, even those who profess to be Christians, believe in an errant Bible. While they might be able to live with their mammoth contradiction, the next contradiction is, uh, excuse me, the next generation is going to take it to the next level and reject it entirely. And that's what we're seeing. Um, we have to stand firm on this issue because the battle for the Bible rages more than ever. It really it was raging back in the 70s and the 80s, but it hasn't abated at all. Because of the last topic that I've talked about, actually twice, the loss of the notion of truth is truth. That's why we really need to talk more about the inerrancy of Scripture. The main issue, the main issue behind inerrancy is a simple one, and that is the authority of the Bible and its truthfulness. It's not some kind of um, just academic... Doc, doctrine. It has to do with the authority of the Bible and it's whether or not God speaks truthfully in his word. Um, the fact that many folks do not like the term uh, is the very reason why it needs to be used because it, it actually kind of draws a line in the sand and brings the issues to the forefront. Um, so at the, at the outset, I wanted just to, maybe for a little fun, uh, deal with two or three alleged contradictions or errors and um, see how, how that goes, and we'll move from there after that to talk about the, what uh, the International Council on Biblical Inerrancy and its statement on inerrancy. Well, let's talk about uh, a couple of, uh, um, I mean, there's dozens and dozens of things that people have brought up over the years, uh, the contradictions and errors, errors supposedly in the Bible, but, um, and I have looked at tons of them, and, and it's been amazing how satisfying the answers have been if you just take the time to research them. And to see that one after another, um, these supposedly um, you know, irreconcilable contradictions were reconciled 
quite easily if you just had the right mindset and took the effort to give the Word of God the um, attention and respect that it uh, deserves. Let's talk first about the mustard seed. Many of you are probably familiar with that uh, situation um, and perhaps that problem, you know, where Jesus said, speaks of the mustard seed in a parable and he talks about it being the smallest seed and it does use the word for smallest seed so there is one esteemed uh, theologian in England who said that's the main reason he couldn't believe in inerrancy because he knew he knew that at that time that there was a flower um, whose seed was indeed smaller than that of the mustard seed. So Jesus was then um, wrong in his assertion that the mustard seed was the smallest. Uh, so I, the way that this could be dealt with in, in uh, several different ways, but I think the best answer is that Folks were putting the wrong definition on that Greek word. To kind of make a long story short, short, the Greek word that is used for seed there has explicit and specific reference to the kind of seed that was known to the audience at that time that was used specifically in planting crops, um, growing things in, in agriculture. Um, and you're you, the original audience would have been an agrarian, agrarian agricultural um, audience. So the point being is that in that particular reference, it was and is the smallest seed when it comes to that particular category of seeds that are used for planting for um, in agriculture, um, which you know flowers are not in that that regard. Uh, they're seeds, but they're not grown for for food and so forth. So. It boiled down in this situation as far as the um, answer for that was, as it often does, boil down to definitions. In this case, it's, um, knowing the original language, Greek, helped. And as I said, it was the smallest seed of that kind. And it's important I say that because in the Greek, again, um, there is there's no doubt that Jesus is making an explicit claim that it it was the smallest, so you couldn't wiggle it out by trying to water down the, the smallest seed part of it. Okay, then secondly, perhaps you've also wondered about the uh, seeming contradiction between where Judas in one gospel hangs himself. And then in another gospel, it talks about his innards being split open. So how do we explain that? Well, seems to me that the most simple explanation is probably the best in this situation. And that is that he probably hung himself and he bloated. He fell and he burst open. And one gospel writer reported him at one stage, that is the hanging stage, and the other gospel writer reported the event um, afterwards when he had fallen. A third um, Example would be, and this is a huge one, that has to do with the whole issue of Moses. And I know that when I say in the Old Testament, it was just pounded 
to us, into us over and over again. There's no way that Moses could have written the Pentateuch. It was written by countless people um, over many decades and uh, actually centuries. Um, you know, documentary hypothesis and all that um, stuff that really turns out to be bankrupt junk, intellectually bankrupt. Um, the answer to, you know, Moses writing the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible, um, is there good evidence for it? Yeah, internally and externally. Uh, well, let me, let me address this issue. Some folks will say, well, how, how can Moses write about his own death? And I don't think it's a plausible way to say that he, uh, under inspiration, spoke of his own death. I don't think that's a good answer. I think that the best answer for how Moses' um, death is spoken about in the Pentateuch is that Joshua, who was his assistant and was also filled um, with the Spirit, um, there was a common th um, theme and practice, I should say, amongst writers is that if they were an assistant to someone and they were both writing, that the assistant, if what they wrote, they would, quote, hook in to the previous author, um, his writings. So we know that Joshua comes after, uh, his book comes after the last book of Moses. So it makes sense that Joshua was probably the one who, under inspiration, uh, made the comments about uh, about his death and uh, uh, about his character. And think also of this man Moses, who lived uh, about 1500 BC. Scholars differ whether it was 1500 or 1200, but I think it was 1500. But we know that he was extremely well educated because he was raised in um, Pharaoh's court. So he had the best education in the world at that time. So he was very well, um, no telling how many languages he knew. So, with the, as I said, the internal and external evidence supports the fact that Moses had every ability and opportunity to write the first five books of the Bible. He had the time, he had the training. Um, another issue is that uh, critical scholars point out that often that Genesis 1 and 2 are contradictory accounts of creation. But if you, upon, um, it doesn't take a expert to see this. They're not contradictory, they're complementary. If you read chapter 1 of Genesis, you'll see that it is God creating the entire universe. And then um, the bigger picture, the macro picture, and uh, then the second chapter zeroes in on the pinnacle of his creation and that's mankind the creation of man and after god had created the environment for his image bearer then in chapter two moses shifts gears in uh in a pretty brilliant way and focuses in on like what you call the micro um, kind of vision of this stage of creation. So that's just a, a few things I just wanted to point out to you that there are uh, there are dozens and dozens of things that people are say, say are either contradictions or errors, and that's you know there's a difference between the two. Errors would just be flat out mistakes supposedly, and then contradictions would be statements, two statements that uh, don't correspond to each other. But I have seen through the use of uh, logic and the original language and so forth, just dozens and dozens of these things 
um, see very satisfactory answers for these. And so, you know, some, some people really do struggle with this issue. So um, just know that there are good answers to the alleged contradictions and errors. And there's some good books out there as well. All righty. What I'd like to do at this point is to um, read and then at certain points make comments um, about a statement that was written in 1978. In the early to mid-70s, there was a real um, battle for the Bible. Uh, actually, Harold Lenzel, who was the former editor for Christianity Today, wrote a red book, I remember, and that was actually called The Battle for the Bible. And he named names, you know, of professors at evangelical seminaries who no, who no, no longer held to a true inerrant view of the Bible, even though the school's statement of faith said that uh, they did believe in it. So um, about 278, 260 so of the world's finest, most brilliant theologians, evangelicals, came together and convened in Chicago for um, this International Council on Biblical Inerrancy, and they put together a brilliant statement on it, which I think is going to stand the test of time as far as defining what inerrancy is, uh, its importance, uh, what it means and doesn't mean. And this is the first time in the history of the church that a council has convened to put together a comprehensive statement on scripture, which uh, is pretty fascinating. So let me read the opening statement, and um, hopefully this will help you in understanding what inerrancy is. God who is himself truth and speaks truth only, has inspired Holy Scripture in order thereby to reveal himself to lost mankind through Jesus Christ as Creator and Lord, Redeemer and Judge. Holy Scripture is God's witness to himself. Holy Scripture being God's own word, written by men, prepared and superintended by his Spirit, is of infallible divine authority in all matters upon which it touches. It is to be believed as God's instruction in all that it affirms. Let me stop there for a second. That's a key phrase, in all that it affirms, because it actually contains lies and rec records many lies um, in the narrative portions of Scripture. It records Satan's words, it records many of the comments of wicked kings. Uh, it even says that God doesn't exist. Uh, actually, um, is it uh, Psalm 14 where it says, um, for, for 14, that the fool says in his heart, uh, there is no God. But the point being is that is where the Bible affir affirms and teaches things that um, that that's when it's true. Um, it is true in all that it affirms. It uh, it is to be obeyed as God commands in all that it requires, embraced as God's pledge and all that it promises. The Holy Spirit, Scripture's divine author both authenticates it to us by his inward witness and opens our minds to understand its meaning. Uh, that's one of the things I want to uh, touch on really soon is, is how to interpret Scripture. Being holy and verbally God-given, Scripture is without error or fault in all its teaching, no less in what it states about God's acts in creation, about the events of world history, and about its own literary origins under God, than in its witness to God's saving grace in individual lives. That's an important point because some people would say that God's word is inerrant when it comes to religious issues, faith and practice, so to speak. You know, that's the big issue um, about the Bible is, is, is 
salvation, faith, and issue, faith and um, um, practice. But the point is that it has to be true about everything um, when it touches on history and science, because if it doesn't speak the truth there, then we have no reason to believe um, it when it comes to spiritual matters. It's either true or it's not. So, the authority of Scripture is inescapably impaired if this total divine inerrancy is in any way limited or disregarded or made relative to a view of truth contrary to the Bible's own. And such lapses bring serious loss to both the individual and the church. Now, here's where um, it shift gears and there are, I believe it's 19 articles of affirmation and denial so let's go through those very clear explanation of uh, inerrancy here article one we affirm that the holy scriptures are to be received as the authoritative word of God we deny that the scriptures receive their authority from the church tradition or any other source and that, that, of course, would be against what? Yeah, that would be contrary to, to Roman Catholicism. Article 2. We affirm that the scriptures are the supreme written norm by which God binds the conscience and that the authority of the church is subordinate to that of scripture. We deny that church creeds, councils, or declarations have authority greater than than or equal to the authority of the Bible. That would again be contra the Roman Catholicism. But also in our own day, there are some hyper local church uh, authorities where um, the pastor is like a Moses type in his authority. And some people see his word as being, uh, you know, right there with, with the Bible. Three. We affirm that the written word in its entirety is revelation given by God. We deny that the Bible is merely a witness to revelation, or only becomes revelation in encounter, or depends on the responses of men for its validity. Okay, now, and that is basically denying either liberalism or what's called neo-orthodox theology which talks about how um, when we encounter God in his word it becomes the word of God it's not the word of God but it can become the word of God for us in the moment while we're reading it um, but what this statement is highlighting and accenting is the objective absolute truthfulness and truth of God's word um, God said it that settles it <laughs> so, five, four. We affirm that God, who made mankind in his image, has used language as a means of revelation. Okay. My comment is God's, this is God speaking as Trinity. Um, part of his attribute is uh, that he's a speaking God. You know, question I would ask to these folks who don't think that um, human language is an ad adequate vehicle for God to communicate as it don't do we not think that God knows Hebrew or Greek <laughs> those languages you know, it actually tells us in Acts um, in one place where the Lord spoke to Paul in, uh, in Hebrew nice little detail we deny that human language is so limited by our creatureliness that it, rend it is rendered inadequate as a vehicle for divine revelation. We further deny that the corruption of human culture and language through sin has thwarted God's work of, of um, inspiration. 5. We affirm that God's revelation in the Holy Scriptures was progressive. We deny that later revelation, which may fulfill earlier revelation, ever corrects or contradicts it. We further deny that any normative revelation has been given since 
the completion of the New Testament writings, normative revelation. Now that would be contrary to Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, <clears throat> and I really believe that the um, revelations that were received by the uh, founders of Jehovah's Witness and Mormons, um, that they, it was a true supernatural encounter, but it was demonic. And cults, all the cults, um, affirm this continuing um, normative revelation. They say that the Bible is not enough, and they and they alone have received directly from God normative revelation. <clears throat> Six, <clears throat> we affirm that the whole of Scripture and all its parts, down to the very words of the original, were given by divine inspiration. We deny that the inspiration of Scripture can rightly be affirmed by the whole without the parts or of some parts but not the whole. My comment is, if we affirm the Bible is inspired, then we, we, we have to mean the words themselves are inspired or inspiration becomes a meaningless concept. Six, seven, we affirm that inspiration was a work in which God, uh, by His Spirit, through human writers, gave us His Word. The origin of scriptures is divine. The mode of divine inspiration remains largely a mystery to us. And my comment or addition is simply that we, <clears throat> we really shouldn't see it like um, the divine equivalent of uh, automatic writing. That, again, is like a, a, a demonic counterfeit, and um, the devil is really good at counterfeiting God's word, uh, his actions. We deny that inspiration can be reduced to human insight or to heightened states of consciousness of any kind. You know, when some people think of inspiration, they reduce it to the notion of saying somebody like uh, Michelangelo or Shakespeare and how they were inspired. And that's not the kind of inspiration that the Bible speaks about uh, concerning itself. It's, uh, it's a whole different animal. We're talking about inspiration in this sense means God breathed. Article 8. We affirm that God in his work of inspiration utilized the distinctive personalities and literary styles of the writers whom he had chosen and prepared. In other words, ordinary people communicated through ordinary language to ordinary people. We deny that God, in causing these writers to use the very words that he chose, override, overrode their personalities. Nine. We affirm these, that inspiration, though not conferring omniscience, omniscience, guaranteed true and trustworthy utterance on all matters of which the biblical authors were moved to speak and write. We deny that the finitude or fallenness of these writers, by necessity or otherwise, introduced distortion or falsehood in God's word. My comment. You've heard a saying, to err or to err is human and some people have taken that to mean that if the Bible is even at least partially human, um, then because to err is human, the Bible has to have errors in it. Then if it has any human element to it all, but I'll ask you a question. Have you ever spoken the truth before? <laughs> and were, were you a human being when you spoke the truth? So... Even though, um, there, since the fall particularly, there's some truth to that saying, to err is human, um, we can't flip it around and say um, that humans have to err, when, um, particularly if someone is under the inspiration of the God of truth and the Holy Spirit of truth, then they're going to be kept from... Um, 
mistakes and uh, errors. And you know what it really boils down to is that the critics of the Bible, um, again, it boils down to our attitude towards this issue. The critics of the Bible um, are just hostile. So you know, instead of you know, we have a choice of being being hostile or sympathetic to the Bible and the possibilities of it having contradictions and errors. And if we come at it with a hostile attitude, um, then we're gonna, you know, we're gonna find errors and contradictions left and right. They're not really errors, and contradictions, but um, the proper approach for folks, the really the scholarly approach, which they would do in other instances, is <laughs> to give like we do with people in general, or at least should, and that's a charitable thing, to give the person the benefit of the doubt. But for some reason, professors um, not only not give the benefit of the doubt, but they give the Bible the benefit of the uh, the un, um, of the distrust, or the un, um, I guess the, the benefit of... Um, of what's the distrust... Anyway, Article 10, we affirm that inspiration, strictly speaking, applies only to the autographic text of Scripture, which, in the providence of God, can be ascertained from available manuscripts with great accuracy. We further affirm that copies and translations of Scripture are the Word of God to the extent that they faithfully represent the original. We deny that any essential element of the Christian faith is affected by the absence of the autographs. We further deny that the, this absence renders the assertion of the biblical inerrancy invalid or irrelevant. Okay, that's stop there. Okay, that's one that I've heard a lot. Is it why do you even talk about inerrancy if you're saying that it applies to the autographs, which is you know, the original copy of the book of Romans or Galatians, which God in his mysterious good providences made sure that we don't have anymore. And um, we can know that that is good, that we don't, uh, for whatever reason in God's mind. But um, people, I think they stated it well. I'm just adding my own thoughts here because I... Um, People seem to think that that just renders all the comments about inerrancy as being irrelevant um, since they supposedly ap apply only to the autographs and they miss the point of what's being said here is that what we have is essentially the autographs we have 5,000 copies or manuscripts and just for an exa example if the Constitution of the United States um, was destroyed by terrorists, then we, would, we wouldn't have any problem at all uh, regaining the exact wording of the original because of all the many copies made. And because of the fact that um, uh, the Greek, there are so many thousands of manuscripts and manuscript families um, we can know as it's that 99.99% um, accuracy that the Bible we have is well, it's that accurate to the original. It, it is the Word of God. So, 11. We affirm that scriptures having been given by divine inspiration is infallible. So, that far from misleading us is true and reliable in all the matters it addresses. We deny that it is possible for the Bible to be at the same time infallible and errant in its assertions. Infallibility and inerrancy may be distinguished but not separated. Actually, infallibility is the stronger term. Um, there is, particularly in England, but also in the United States, 
Inerrancy is an emotive word, and folks don't like it because it makes them think of uh, backwards fundamentalism. But like I said, these 260 uh, men were all guys, uh, folks with PhDs and brilliant people. And um, they, the point, one of the things that was um, pointed out was that some people would say that the Bible is infallible, but they would not affirm that it's inerrant. Inerrant, but they're showing their um, inconsistency there uh, because in, infallibility is the stronger word because it means that the Bible can ha, cannot make mistakes or err. It's unable to. All in, inerrancy means is it does not make mistakes. But infallibility means it cannot. So, make mistakes. 12. We affirm that scripture is entirely, uh, entirely is inerrant, being free from all falsehood, fraud, and deceit. We deny that the biblical infallibility and inerrancy are limited to the spiritual, religious, or redemptive themes. Exclusion of assertions in the fields of history and science. We further deny that scientific hypothesis about the earth history may be properly may properly be used to overturn the teaching of the scriptures on creation and the flood. Um, okay, I just uh, for time's sake, keep moving on. We affirm the propriety of using inerrancy as a theological term with reference to the complete truthfulness of scripture. We deny that it is proper to evaluate scripture according to the standards of truth and error that are alien to its usage or purpose. We further de deny um, that inerrancy is negated by biblical phenomena such as, listen to this, the lack of modern technical precision, irregularities of grammar or spelling, observational descriptions of nature, like the sun rising, the reporting of falsehoods, the use of hyperbole in round numbers, the topical arrangement of material, variant selections and materials and parallel accounts, or the use of free citations. Um, that list right there can explain many of the alleged errors and contradictions. Um, we have to remember that inerrancy doesn't is not synonymous with precise precision. And ask you a quick question: quick question. If your ch local church is 7.2 miles away, would you hesitate to tell your friends that you live seven miles from it? Um, no, nah, because we we understand that it's it's appropriate and we use it all the time, um, approximate language, and that's what is being talked about there in part. Um, 14. We affirm the unity and the internal consistency of Scripture. We deny that alleged errors and discrepancies that have not yet been resolved vitiate the truth claims of the Bible. And I can tell you, there's not many uh, unresolved um, alleged contradictions because after 2,000 years, um, uh, most of them have been um, resolved very satisfactorily. Fifteen, we affirm that the doctrine of inerrancy is grounded in the teaching of the Bible about inspiration. I think about Matthew 5. We deny that Jesus' teaching about scriptures may be dismissed by appeals to accommodation to any natural limitation of his humanity. 16. We affirm that the doctrine of inerrancy has been integral to the church's faith throughout its history, and we deny that inerrancy is a doctrine invented by scholastic Protestantism or is a reactionary position postulated in response to negative higher criticism. We affirm that the Holy Spirit bears witness to the scriptures, assuring believers of the truthfulness of God's written word. We deny that this witness of the Holy Spirit operates in isolation from or against Scripture. We affirm that the text of Scripture is to be interpreted by the grammatico-historical exegesis, taking account of its literary forms and devices, 
and the scripture is to interpret scripture. By the way, they have a separate section or uh, document on um, uh, hermeneutics. We deny the legitimacy of any treatment of the text or quest for sources lying behind it that leads to relativizing, dehistoricizing, or discounting its teaching or rejecting its claimed authorship. And then lastly, 19, we affirm that a confession of full authority, infallibility, and inerrancy of Scripture is vital to a sound understanding of the whole of the Christian faith. We further affirm that such confession should lead to increasing conformity to the image of Christ. We deny that such confession is necessary for salvation. However, we further deny that inerrancy can be rejected without grave consequences, both to the individual and to the church. Thank you.